recording. Okay, this is going to be chapter 13. Look at the muscular system. So some of the functions of the muscular system, um, basically, obviously, ambulation, so walking, running, things like that. Um, it's also designed to um, move different materials and things like that. So it can have the ability to move blood. Remember, we talked about that. Um, the skeletal muscles squeezing venous blood up to the heart. Um, and so it can do a lot of things for us. Um, anytime we need to basically move our body, essentially. So I want to move some of the stuff we've already covered in chapter four. And so we'll take a look um, at some of this stuff. So we have three different types of muscle. We have smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. Um, and the cells of muscle are called muscle fibers. So when you hear the term muscle fibers, it's pretty much the identical, it's the same thing as the muscle cells. So that's basically what we're talking about there. And um, just bear with me while I kind of do a quick double check here. Make sure all my settings are accurate. And so um, smooth muscle first are gonna be um, cells that are kind of cylinder-like, but they're pointed at the end. So they kind of have a spindle shape to them. And they generally will have one nucleus in them. And they oftentimes will sort of form um, kind of like groups or clusters of cells kind of stacking on each other in parallel, kind of like a bunch of gummy worms kind of all piled next to each other. So that's basically what smooth muscle will look like. And they kind of form these long sheets. They tend not to have striate, striated uh, pattern to them. This is basically striping um, effects to them. And we usually will find them in the walls of hollow organs, like your intestines or blood vessels, things like that. Now, the important thing to understand is smooth muscle is involuntary. So you don't have to think about it. And this is basically associated with visceral systems. So your core organs and things like that. Um, and so these will contract in order to sort of create a low level of tension, but that's enduring. So um, they don't fatigue easily, which is a good thing because this is basically how like your intestines will move. Um, and so sometimes you have to have these muscles contracting for hours at a time, like when you're digesting. And so they don't fatigue easily because they're kind of a very low level contraction, but they last a very long time. So this is kind of what it looks like. This is basically just simply a recapitulation from chapter four. So just kind of gives you a good look at what the um, smooth muscle cells look like. Then we have cardiac muscle cells, which are pretty much located in the heart. This is the only place you're gonna find cardiac muscle is in the heart itself. It's actually heart muscle. These guys are also, um, sing have a single nucleus. Uh, they tend to be kind of tubular in shape and I can't really draw cardiac muscle cell very well. So we'll wait for the picture and they tend to have striations, although lighter than skeletal. The important thing is cardiac muscle is interlocked. So if you pull it apart, it kind of looks like a little mesh, um, work kind of like a chain link fence. Um, and the, uh, they kind of uh, terminate, each cell terminates to the next cell in a structure called an intercalated disc. And in these areas of intercalated discs, they are connected together with gap junctions. This basically will allow the contraction signal to spread throughout the heart wall so that the heart can contract in unison. So you want uniform unison contraction for the cardiac muscle, and then it will relax completely between contractions. So essentially kind of resetting itself. Um, and this is what prevents fatigue. So fatigue is generally created when you have constant contraction without relaxation. Um, the contraction of cardiac muscle tends to be rhythmic. Remember we talked a little bit about the rhythmicity and the, auto, the automatic um, contraction of the heart in chapter five. Um, it is automatic, it doesn't require nervous stimulation, and it is involuntary, so you don't have to tell your heart to contract, and it's kind of what it looks like. So you can see if we blow this up a little bit, the striated pattern, so there's the light striations, these light 
lines and then you can see these little darker lines here those are those intercalated discs that's what those guys are okay skeletal muscle now skeletal muscle is probably where we spend most of our time talking about muscles when we take a look at a muscle chapter so they tend to be tubular long and cylindrical so they basically are very very long in nature um, they will oftentimes have multiple nuclei in them and they tend to have heavy striations or striping pattern associated with them. And we're going to learn what those stripes are in this chapter. And so this is basically what's making up the muscles of our skeleton. It's attached to our bones. They tend to be very long. They can run uh, for a very, so the fibers themselves can actually run the entire length of the muscle. So they're very, very long. Um, this is basically your voluntary control. So you can basically control these and decide whether or not you want to contract them. And so here's what your uh, skeletal muscle looks like. You can see those really dark striations, uh, much darker than cardiac muscle. And if you look at it uh, long enough, you'll notice you have multiple nuclei um, in a given muscle fiber. <clears throat> okay, so ultimately, um, when we take a look at our musculature, um, we have um, a backbone, right? So we are part of what's called the vertebrates. So the vertebrates are all animals that have a backbone and so they have a vertebral column um, and a skeleton and they have appendages attached to those. So basically what happens is we hang our muscles onto our skeleton and when they contract, they're going to move our bones. So that's basically how we move our appendages around. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the functions of our skeletal muscles. First of all, we're going to need uh, support from our skeletal muscles. For instance, they will contract in order to oppose gravity. That allows us to remain upright. For instance, this is the job of our postural muscles in our back. Sometimes we don't even know that they're even working because they're just constantly contracting, keeping you upright. The other one is, of course, the movement of bones, the ambulation, basically moving everything. So if you move your arms around, you move your legs around, your eyes, whatever, your facial expressions, your breathing. So these are all parts of movements that you need to do from day to day. And so those are all driven by your skeletal muscles. And then, of course, the big one is body temperature. So these guys will use ATP in order to um, generate their contraction because contraction requires ATP. When they do that, it releases a lot of heat. And this is how we maintain our core body temperature. So basically there's a couple of things when you talk about our body temperature. First of all, blood is hot, okay? So your blood is hot. It's actually carrying the heat throughout your body. But where does the heat come from? muscles are the heat generators. And so what happens is when your muscles contract and they generate heat, that heat basically is transferred into the blood and it's carried through your blood um, to keep your core body temperature at about 37 degrees C. Or if you have excess body heat to get rid of it through sweating. <clears throat> now, couple of other things that we're also going to notice is we also have um, fluid movement in the cardiovascular system. For instance, in the veins, it basically is keeping that venous blood moving forward by the skeletal muscles contracting and squeezing on the veins like you're squeezing on a tube of toothpaste. They also will protect your internal organs, right? So oftentimes muscles uh, can pad the bones uh, but a muscular wall can protect your internal organs. A good example are your abdominal muscles. So your abdominal muscles are actually there to protect your intestines and your digestive organs that are just on the other side. And so they can also be very protective. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the structure of muscle. So basically muscles made up of what's called a fascicle. And a fascicle is essentially a bundle of muscle fibers. So for instance, if I have uh, a bunch of muscle fibers that are kind of cut on, on end, so a cross section, I'll have a bunch of muscle fibers like this. And then if I bundle those guys up in a big circle, that's gonna be a fascicle. So if these guys are the muscle fibers, then this guy right here is gonna be the fascicle. 
Now, generally within the fascicle, each fiber is going to be surrounded by a little connective tissue membrane. Um, and then the fascicle itself is going to be uh, surrounded by a membrane. So for instance, you will have, and I want to try to maybe see if I can do a different color here. So you will have a little liner, a little wrap that wraps around your individual muscle fiber. And then you'll also have another wrap. Uh, let's see, maybe change colors, go green, something completely different. Then you'll have another wrap that basically wraps around the fascicle itself. So um, the wrappings, oftentimes uh, we'll run into um, what's called fascia. Fascia is essentially a sheet of connective tissue. And it typically binds your organs together. It tends to cover muscles, and then it can actually extend out and um, become part of the tendon. But oftentimes it binds organs together. In this case, it binds muscles together. And this is so that the organs don't flop around. So, you know, if you just have a bunch of organs in your body, every time you move around, they're going to be kind of jiggling around and sort of getting knocked all over the place inside your body. But what you do is you basically wrap them up tight, kind of like you're sort of doing like an ACE bandage wrap on a twisted ankle or something like that. And you wrap it up tight and that kind of bundles up all those organs and then basically keeps them from sort of jostling around every time you move. Um, there's also another structure that we run into a lot when we take a look at muscles. And actually, we usually talk about this more when we're taking a look at our articulations. And so that's going to be the bursa, right? Where the bursa is essentially a fluid-filled sac. We ran into this one in the last one. And its job is to pad the space between tendons and bones to reduce friction. So it cushions, it lubricates, and it reduces frictional chafing. So muscles tend to come in pairs. Um, number one, in order to move a muscle, you have to have a reference point. For instance, if you want to move a bone, um, then you have to have a, a couple of points of attachment. The first point of attachment called the origin is going to be the stationary point. This is basically the bone that doesn't move. And then on the other attachment that the muscle will make is called the insertion. So this is basically going to be the moving attachment. And this will basically move the bone. So when the muscle contracts, the tendon will pull on the bone at the insertion and it'll move the bone of the insertion wherever direction you want it to move. So for instance, when you have a bicep and you're doing a bicep curl, right? So basically in a bicep curl, your um, insertion is going to be in the forearm, right? So this is gonna be your insertion right here on the radius. That's the bone that's supposed, to, that's the area that's supposed to move. Your origin is going to be attached to the acromion and the coracoid. Right, so this is the origin. So when you shorten your muscle, your arm goes up. That's the insertion being pulled up. Your shoulder doesn't go down, right? Because that's the insertion, that's the non-moving part. And so you have to have every single muscle has an origin and an insertion. And so you have a stable reference point and then you move your bone relative to that reference point. <laughs> so now then once we actually have our muscles attached at origin and insertion then what we tend to do is we tend to group muscles together both in working pairs and also in um, 
what we kind of refer to as sort of antagonists. So the first one that we run into is a type of muscle that we refer to as the agonist. So this is basically the muscle who does most of the work. We oftentimes will refer to this one as the prime mover. Then we'll have another muscle we call the synergist, which is the assistant to the agonist. So basically it's a minor mover. <clears throat> could also be a stabilizer, right? It could keep the rest of the body still while your agonist is moving. And then we have the antagonist. This is the muscle whose movement is the complete opposite of the prime mover. So for instance, if you take a look at your biceps brachii, that would be the prime mover for flexion. of the arm. But the triceps brachii on the back of the arm are the antagonists. These guys are gonna be the prime mover for extension of the arm. <clears throat> and so if they both contract at the same time, it would be a stalemate. It'd be like two people on either end of a tug of war rope and then you would, nobody would win, okay? So when we get to name muscles, we oftentimes will name them after a couple of conventions. Number one, we can name them after size. For instance, your gluteus maximus, which is your, um, your buttocks muscle, the one you sit on, right? So gluteus basically is a gluteal, maximus means it's large. You also have a gluteus minimus and a gluteus medius. Um, so the minimus is gonna be a smaller muscle. Um, some that will also indicate size, vastus is actually a Latin term for huge, longus is a Latin term for long, and brevis, brevity is the soul of wit, as they say, um, that is for short. Sometimes we'll name muscles after their shape. So for instance, your deltoid, which actually is the, um, the third letter of the alphabet, is a, a Greek letter delta is a triangle. And so a deltoid muscle is actually triangular shaped. The trapezius is shaped like a trapezoid. And the latissimus dorsi, or the latissimus uh, in this case, is a term for wide. So it's a very wide muscle. And then teres basically means round. So it's kind of a round shaped muscle. So this is one of the reasons why uh, when students take anatomy and physiology, like they're going to a health uh, field, they will oftentimes take a terminology course because it'll oftentimes help them with their naming and their nomenclature. Um, a third one that we can do is by their location. For instance, your external obliques or your internal obliques, basically their outer or inner sets. Frontalis basically is in the uh, overlying the frontal bone. Um, other sorts of terms, your pectoralis is your chest, your gluteus is your buttock, your brachii is your arm, and sub means beneath. So like sub scapularis, beneath the scapula. There is also, from time to time, we'll run into nomenclature associated with the direction of the muscle fibers. For instance, rectus means straight, so your muscle fibers are running kind of in a straight line. So your rectus abdominis is basically your um, abdominal muscle. Your orbicularis oculi, orbit, to orbit something, is a circular muscle that goes around the eye, oculi. Um, some others that are directional, transverse basically means across, oblique is the same as diagonal. We're not done yet though. We can also do attachment. Um, for instance, this is really helpful actually in like when you take gross anatomy. For instance, the sternocleidomastoid is basically attached to the sternum, the clavicle, clido, and the mastoid process. So it basically has three major attachments. The brachioradialis tells you where it's attached. So it's attached to the brachium, the arm, and the radius, which is your forearm. We can also name muscles after the number of attachments. For instance, the biceps brachii has two attachment points. The quadriceps femoris has four origins, right? So sometimes you'll hear that. And then uh, we can also 
name muscles after their action. For instance, an extensor digitorum extends the fingers. An adductor basically brings um, something, it adducts something, it brings it close to the midline, right? So an adductor longus is a long adductor, it's in the thigh. Some other terms, flexors, for instance, which is to bend or a masseter, which means to chew. The actual term for chewing is mastication. The levator means to lift, like an elevator. Um, so that basically means to lift. And here are basically um, a lot of your muscles. So rather than kind of going through this, um, I'll just kind of let you guys sort of take a look at that. Many of you will probably um, want to take a look at some of these. For instance, you can see you know, that wide latissimus dorsi here. Uh, you can see your trapezius, which is shaped like a trapezoid, right? Um, and so you can, you can see that, that a lot of these terms start to make sense as you start to take a look at where these muscles are and you kind of study a little bit about what they do, their actions. So spend a little time taking a look at this um, and, then, um, and then it'll kind of make a lot of these things sort of make sense in terms of the muscle and the anatomy of the muscles. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the cellular components of the muscle fiber, the structure essentially of the muscle fiber. So first of all, the one thing you need to understand is that in muscle um, terminology, we essentially have the same terms as we have for cells. We just give them different names. For instance, in muscleology, if you will, the plasma membrane is called the sarcolemma, but it's a plasma membrane just like any other cell has a plasma membrane. It, the cytoplasm, we refer to as the sarcoplasm, but it's still the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, which is the muscle fiber. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is the endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth, actually, endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle fiber. So we just call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the important function of the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the muscle fiber is that it stores calcium. It's a calcium storage site and that becomes an important piece of its mechanism of muscle contraction later on. We also have a structure in the muscle cells that aren't actually part of a normal cell. It's really unique to muscle fibers called the T-tubules or the transverse tubules. And so what a transverse tubule is, it's an invagination of the sarcolemma. So for instance, if you've got the sarcolemma going along like this, what happens is that sarcolemma dives down deep like that. And basically it kind of creates this tubule, this T-tubule. And so you have several of them. They look like a little mine shaft that basically goes, dips down into um, the center of the cell. And so it tends to sort of get sandwiched between portions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, structurally speaking. And we'll take a look at what that looks like here in just a second. So these guys right here are the T-tubules and this is the sarcolemma. So um, for you table types who like tables, this is your table. Basically, it's just a definitional table of all the muscle names. So for instance, sarcolemma, plasma membrane, sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm. Myoglobin is an actual protein um, that's used for muscle contraction. It's a red pigment um, that will store oxygen. We talked about the T-tubule, it's an invagination of the sarcolemma that dips down into the muscle fiber. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is your smooth ER that stores calcium. Then you have a couple of other guys here. So you got myofibrils, which are essential bundles of myofilaments, which are basically protein filaments. And we'll talk more about those here in just a second. And then you have um, myofilaments, which are essentially bundles of myofibrils. So essentially the myofilament, um, excuse me, the other way around. The myofibrils, bundles of myofilaments, and the myofilaments are the actual individual protein fibers. So a myofilament will make up a myofibril. We'll take a closer look at those as we get deeper into the chapter. So within um, the muscle fiber itself, so you have your sar sarcolemma, and within the muscle fiber, 
you'll see lots of myofibrils. Now, this is a little bit of a weird phrasing here in this particular PowerPoint because the sarcolemma doesn't contain myofibrils. It's the muscle fibers that contain the myofibrils and then they're wrapped, they cover, the sarcolemma will cover the whole cell, the whole fiber, just like a plasma membrane would do. Now the, sar the sarcoplasm will also have glycogen for energy. Um, and that'll allow you some muscle contraction. And it'll also have myoglobin, which will bind to oxygen and store it for you. Now, when you take a look at the muscle fiber, um, it's a cylindrical shape. And inside that large cylinder are smaller cylinders called the myofibrils. Now the fire my myofibrils run the length of the muscle fiber and they themselves are made of even smaller cylinders called the myofilaments. Thus, basically a muscle cell is essentially like a cable of cable of cables, right? So it's like a, a suspension bridge cable where like if you ever cut a, the golden gate uh, bridge cable in cross section, what you'll see is a large cable that's made out of smaller cables and those cables are actually made out of smaller cables and those are actually made out of smaller cables. So it's like a, a nested sort of a cabling system. At the very bottom, you have the myofilaments. And so the myofilaments will basically bundle together to make myofibrils. The myofibrils will bundle together to make the muscle fiber. And we've already seen that the muscle fiber will bundle together to make a fascicle. So it's kind of like those little uh, Russian, um, those like little Russian dolls where you'll always have you know, one inside the other. So that's kind of what it looks like. So starting off, first of all, you have the individual myofilaments that basically form a cable to create a myofibril. And then within a muscle fiber, you're gonna multiple myofibrils, so like you have one here, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there covered by this little wrapper right here, which is your plasma membrane, that's the sarcolemma. So this whole thing right here is one muscle fiber and you can see um, a couple of things here that I wanna point out. But then your muscle fiber, you'll have multiple muscle fibers that basically form the fascicle So you have multiple muscle fibers forming um, oh wait, sorry, I got that backwards. Hold on one second. So this is the myofibril, this little piece here. So that's the muscle fiber right there. And so each of these muscle fibers is going to be pulled together in the fascicle. So this is the fascicle here. So they got this circled right there, this guy right there. And then a bundle of fascicles will give you your muscle, the, bun the body, the muscle. So you kind of see you go all the way up. Another thing I want to point out here is um, the T-tubules. So the green things here are the T-tubules. So you'll notice here at the top of the invagination as it goes down. What it does is it basically creates this little structure where you can see the blue part is your sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you can see your sarcoplasmic reticulum creates this like tubular system that's like you got a piece of it here and a piece of it here and then the T-tubule in the middle. These three together, um, you have your sarcoplasmic reticulum, like that. You have your other sarcoplasmic reticulum like this. And then in the middle, you've got your T-tubule. The three of these together is what's called the triad. And so your T-tubule is basically dipping down into the cell and it's essentially communicating with that smooth endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
Now let's go ahead and take a look at this, the sarcomeres. So the sarcomeres are essentially what's behind the striations. Remember we had the striations in skeletal muscles. And so the striations are there because of the way we orient our myofilaments inside our myofibrils. There's two different types of myofilaments. These are the protein threads. First of all, there's what's called the thick filaments, which is made of a protein called myosin, which is a type of motor protein. And this is a protein, a motor protein basically is a type of protein that basically just grabs onto something and, and moves it or motors it down um, a given pathway. For instance, uh, we have microtubules in the cell that will essentially take a motor protein which has a walking domain. And then it's got a cargo binding domain. And then it'll take whatever it needs to grab. So it'll grab some sort of cargo and then it'll basically walk that cargo along um, the microtubules. And typically this requires ATP. So this is the reason why contraction requires ATP. So myosin is a type of motor protein. So it has the ability to sort of grab onto stuff and pull on it, okay? Grabs and pulls. Now the thin filament is gonna be composed of a protein called actin. Now, when you put these guys together in the myofibrils, basically what happens is the structure of how you uh, arrange these myofilaments basically creates these zones, if you will, and this kind of banding look. So the first one that we want to take a look at is what's called the Z lines. So the Z lines are these vertical discs that look something like this, and they basically form the boundary of a sarcomere. So from one Z line to another Z line is one sarcomere. Then we have what's called the I band. So this is a light colored band that's made up of only thin filaments. So the I band typically will cross over the Z disc. And then we have the A band, which is a, a region of overlap. So basically tethered to the Z disc is gonna be actin. So these are actin filaments. They look like this. So let me do a legend here. Red is going to be actin. Then in the middle, you're going to have myosin. Looks like that. And part of myosin, it has these little heads that will grab on to the actin. Okay. Please be patient. I am trying to fix something.
bear with me. I apologize. Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, I am back in action, it looks like. Um, and I will hopefully, I have no idea what happened, but it just pretty much died on me. So I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish this chapter. Um, please let me know what you guys see. Okay, so here's where we were. I just defined um, actin. And so now what we have is myosin. And so we have myosin here and they have these little heads which will grab onto the actin. Like this. And then what that'll create is what we refer to as the A band. So the A band is the region of overlap. So this is the A band. And then in the middle is what we refer to as the H band. So this little region right here is the H band. So um, rather than kind of uh, doing that, I wanna show you a picture of it. We have a picture coming up here in just a second and it'll kind of hopefully make things a little bit more sensible. So. Basically, the thick filaments are made of myosin, and so they have basically this structure where they kind of have this club-like shaft or this rod, and then generally speaking, what will happen is they have a little hinge, and then they have a little head, and the head basically makes contact with the actin and creates what's called the cross bridge. The thin filaments, however, are made of actin, but there's other proteins in there as well. There's a rope-like protein called tropomyosin. And then another protein called troponin with the several different types of binding spots. So basically, um, the sarcomeres will shorten. And when the sarcomeres shorten, the muscle fiber shortens, and then the whole muscle shortens, and that creates tension. So in what we refer to now as the sliding filament model, what happens is the thin filaments will slide past the thick filaments, kind of like a tug of war. So what will happen is the thick filaments, that is to say the myosin heads, will grab a hold of the actin. And then as they grab a hold of the actin, they form these cross bridges. They basically pull and they pivot their head like this. And that pulls the actin in toward themselves. That shortens the sarcomere. So the Z lines will move inward. The H band almost disappears. And then you get a shortening sarcomere. This is what it looks like. So here you can see your Z lines here. Your I band is going to be um, this region here. So from one um, A band to the next is gonna be your I band. And then your A band is gonna be this region of overlap. So this is basically the region of overlap between your two filaments. And then here you can see your myosin heads and your myosin and you can see your actin filaments there. So what's gonna happen is when it shortens, you can see the myosin heads are gonna grab onto it. They're gonna pull this direction and that's going to pull and slide these actin filaments in toward each other and so you're going to get a shortened sarcomere that's a contracted sarcomere so that's basically how things contract in muscles of course in order to do this you need atp atp is your energy source to basically pull it off so as your myosin heads break down atp this allows the energy to pull and also to form cross bridges. It's kind of like a tug of war, right? So basically, if you think of your arms as a myosin, the forearm is like the long shaft-like, and the hand, your hand is the myosin head. Your myosin head pivots along a hinge, your wrist. So if you grab onto a tug of war rope, then you have an attachment piece, right? So you first of all have to attach, put in this order, that you attach. And then that you're attached, you can pull, right? So you pivot along your wrist. 
and you pull the rope towards you in what's called your power stroke. You're pulling the rope towards you. Just like myosin is pulling the actin toward it. And then once you get done pulling the rope, you detach to go figure out how to attach again, right? So you want to keep pulling it towards you. So you kind of detach and you do reattach and then do a pull. So you kind of reset your system. Same thing's happening kind of in the muscles. Only in this case, the myosin is pulling on the actin, kind of like it's pulling on a tug of war rope. So the way that we regulate muscle fiber contraction is through the nervous system. Typically, you're going to be driving the signals of contraction through the motor neuron. So this is essentially a type of neuron that will typically send a special contraction signal to the muscle fibers. And so the nerve itself is actually a group of neurons typically bundled together. So they're all kind of a team. And each neuron has an axon, which is a part of the neuron that essentially stimulates the muscle fiber. Basically, this is uh, the outgoing, this is your neuron's outgoing contraction signal. <clears throat> and so at the end, it'll branch and spread out so it can talk to many different muscle fibers. So here you can see a motor neuron that has its axon coming into the muscle. And then what will happen is that axon will branch out and it'll basically make contact with multiple muscle fibers. So you can communicate and coordinate across a lot of different muscle fibers. So this terminal port, this terminal area is um, where what we refer to as the axon terminal, it's the end of the axon. And this is the one that actually comes near to the sarcolemma. And so the interface between the neuron, your motor neuron and the muscle is what we refer to as the neuromuscular junction. Doesn't, um, it doesn't actually make contact. There's actually a little bit of a gap between the axon and um, the muscle, the target, or the sarcolemma. We call that syn the synaptic cleft. So this is basically a space that separates the two. So what we have to do is we have to basically get the signal across that space so that we can um, get that to the target cell, in this case, the muscle cell. So what happens then is that these axon terminate are little vesicles called synaptic vesicles, and they are full of neurotransmitter. In this case, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. This is basically the one for contracting muscles. So when a nerve signal goes down the axon and it arrives at the axon terminus, it signals those synaptic vessels to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And the acetylcholine then carries the message. Let's finish this sentence for that carries the message to contract to the sarcolemma. So acetylcholine will diffuse across the cleft. It'll bind to receptors in the sarcolemma. This will reignite an electrical signal in the sarcolemma, which will start to spread through the sarcolemma. And then as it reaches the T-tubule, it'll dip down into the T-tubule where it will cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. So if you take a look at our little structure, here's our T-tubule, and then here's our sarcoplasmic reticulum. So what's gonna happen is the reignition of the electrical signal will start to ripple down the sarcolemma. It'll dive down into the T-tubule and it'll make contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will then release calcium out into the muscle fiber. That's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> so here you can see your synaptic, your axon terminus. First of all, that's the end point of your axon terminus. You'll see your synaptic vesicle that's full of acetylcholine. And then the gap here is your synaptic cleft. And then of course on the other side, you got your sarcolemma for the muscle cell. And then what happens is once that electrical signal comes down, the axon, it'll signal these synaptic vesicles to dump their acetylcholine into the cleft, which will then bind and open up um, and reignite that contraction signal 
in the muscle. So here's a blow up of that. So here you can see your acetylcholine basically binding to these little receptors and it opens up these channels and that basically causes an inrush of sodium which reignites your um, your electrical signal and that starts to run through the sarcolemma. So muscle fiber contraction. First of all, there are two proteins in the thin filaments that we need to understand before we get the muscle fiber contraction. The tropomyosin, which is kind of like a rope-like uh, um, protein, this is actually covering binding sites for myosin. So these are the areas where the myosin heads need to bind to actin. And so normally it's covering it up. So as long as tropomycin is covering it up, you can't actually bind and make those cross bridges. The component is basically um, kind of peppered throughout the thin filament, um, but it will be bound to tropomycin. So when calcium is released in the sarcoplasm in particular, it binds with the troponin. And that causes the troponin to grab onto the tropomyosin and to pull it off. So when it's bound to calcium, it grabs tropomyosin and pulls it off the binding site. Presence of calcium, you expose those myosin binding sites so you can form cross bridges. So here's what it looks like. So you can see your tropomyosin is covering up these little binding sites here. And then when calcium comes in and binds to its opponent, so here's the opponent here. So your troponin will pull on the rope, exposing these binding sites. And now you can form your cross bridges and get that pull. Okay. So steps to fiber, muscle fiber contraction. First of all, the myosin heads um, have ATP binding sites. So ATP is bound at this site. And then what will happen is it'll split to form ADP and it'll generate and it'll basically give off energy. Then what happens is the myosin heads will attach the actin and that'll form a cross bridge. And then ADP and phosphate are released and the myosin heads will bend. This is your power stroke, right? That pulls the actin filaments. Then what's gonna happen is the binding of the myos of the ATP is what's gonna break those cross, so the next ATP that is to say. So that's gonna break those cross bridges and then you get the detachment from actin and then the cycle begins again. And it recurs over and over and over again as long as you have ATP. Now, when you have things like rigor mortis, um, rigor mortis is basically when your muscles get tense after death. And the reason is because you don't have any more ATP to break those cross bridges. So what happens is if you don't have any ATP because you're not alive making it anymore, you, those cross bridges never get broken. So your muscles seize up and they stay contracted. And so they just basically have to wait for just the muscles to deteriorate and to degrade before the muscles sort of relax again. Okay, I kind of feel like um, PowerPoint is wanting to crash on me again. There's a serious PowerPoint problem right now uh, for some reason, and I don't understand why.
Okay. So this is kind of what um, this is kind of what it looks like. So in step one, we have ATP, which is hydrolyzed, and um, the myosin head at this point is unattached. And so what happens is after you hydrolyze that ATP, then you're going to be able to attach. So your ADP and your phosphate um, are bound to the myosin. That basically permits the attachment. And then what's going to happen is you're going to lose your ADP and your phosphate. That gives you your power stroke. And so you can see your myosin head pulling on the actin. And then after that, the new ATP will come in and that'll create the detachment so you can do it all over again. And so that's basically the how the um, Okay, hold on one second, let me see. Okay. Bear with me one second. Let me see if I need to reboot PowerPoint because man, PowerPoint is just an absolute stinker today. Okay, so let's take a look at whole muscle contraction. So essentially what we have is what's called a motor unit. And so in a motor unit, um, you have a nerve fiber, first of all, and all the muscle fibers that it innervates, that's one motor unit. And so all mu muscle fibers in a motor unit are stimulated once and they either contract or they don't. And the number of muscle fibers within a motor unit varies. So you can have some motor units, um, like fine control will only have a few fibers, so very fine control. Other motor units for strength will have lots of muscle fibers. Typically, the more muscle fibers you have, the more gross motor movement you've got, not the fine, the fine stuff. So muscle twitch, then we get to muscle twitch. This is a single contraction of a muscle fiber. It lasts only a fraction of a second. But we have three different periods that we can divide it into. First one is going to be what's called a latent period. This is a time that it requires between stimulation and the actual contraction initiation. During this particular point, um, the, ace, the acetylcholine is diffusing across that synaptic cleft. The electric signal is galloping across the sarcolemma and down the T-tubule. So that's what's happening in the latent period. In the contraction period, this is where the calcium is released by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then it causes the cross bridge formation of the myosin. And then finally, in the relaxation period, this is when those cross bridges are broken. The calcium returns back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcomeres will lengthen again to adopt their normal length. So here's kind of what it looks like. So at the point of stimulus, you get a latent period while you're trying to communicate um, all of that to the T tubules, and then you get your contraction period. And so that's basically when you're getting your calcium and your cross bridges and your power stroke and all that sort of stuff. And then your relaxation period when your cross bridges are breaking and you're resetting the system back down to normal. Now we have a couple of different types of twitch uh, dynamics that we take a look at. One is called summation. This is basically where you have increased muscle contraction over time. So basically you kind of increase or add to or summate your muscle contraction over time. Um, and so this is basically will give you sustained muscle contraction. And so sustained muscle contraction um, can also be called tetanus. When it's achieved, that basically is contraction without relaxation. Um, so the muscle will contract all the time, but it won't relax. This is the reason why you get muscle fatigue um, and because you just, you are not relaxing. So when the muscle relaxes, um, that basically is like your muscle giving up. So that's fatigue. Fatigue is like when your muscle is giving up. Even though the stimulation is coming, the muscle just can't respond because it just doesn't have any more energy to do that. And so this is not the same thing as the infection tetanus. This is normal. 
um, tetanus, for instance, in a muscle is just prolonged contraction without relaxation. That's all it is. So here's what it looks like. So you first of all get your stimulus. So you get your contraction on one side, and then you're supposed to get your relaxation. But if you don't relax all the way and you recontract because another stimulus comes in, then you've contracted and then you do a little bit of a relaxation, but you haven't gone all the way back down to your relaxation. So you're not really relaxing all that much. It's like, instead of getting your full amount of sleep, you're just taking like a five, 10 minute cat nap. And then summation will then basically add it all the way up without relaxation. So you can see these little mini relaxations are not really significant. And then tetanus you can see is contraction without that relaxation. And then once you get to fatigue, it's like your muscles are just spent and they're just like, you know, say what you want, do as much stimulus as you want. I just, I can't do it anymore. And so that's your muscles giving up. And so you can see that happens when the stimulus is coming rapid fire, boom, 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 one right after another. Now recruitment is something that we see in muscles. This is essentially uh, the intensity of the nervous stimulation increases over time. So basically you have more motor units um, and the muscles are activated as you need to increase the amount of tension to accommodate your load. So maximum muscle contraction that requires all the mo motor units. Um, this is going to be all the motor units are going to be in tetanus. So that means they're going to be full contract without, um, without relaxation. Now, this doesn't usually happen because they would all fatigue at the same time and you would have no more muscle movement, right? Instead, what happens is they swap back and forth between motor units. So one motor unit will contract while the others rest. And then that one will come off duty and then another one will take its shift. And so your muscles actually rotate between motor units to basically maintain constant tension. Now, there's also this issue of muscle tone. Right. Muscle tone basically is similar to muscle firmness. It's kind of a sense of readiness, if you will, ready to contract. And so this basically depends on how much you use your muscle um, and how much it contracts. And um, this will like contract your muscles, but it won't be enough to actually cause a movement. So muscle tone is sort of like a basic readiness to contract. If you tone your muscles, they're going to be more likely to contract easily and efficiently than if they're not toned. So what about fuel? How do you feed muscle contraction? We have four main sources of energy. First of all, you have glycogen and triglycerides that are stored in the muscle, right? And then, of course, you have glucose and fatty acids in the blood. And so depending on the intensity, you'll use all of these as your energy sources. As you exercise for longer periods of time, then um, the muscle stores in uh, will deplete, and then you have to use energy sources in the blood. Okay, so this is kind of what it looks like: the percentage of energy expend. So you can see uh, the blue is triglycerides, fatty acids, glucose, and glycogen. So you can see at early um, intervals, you are largely burning muscle glycogen. And then as you move into an hour's worth of exercise, you are now equally burning fatty acids and glycogen. As you move into the second hour, it's going to be mostly fatty acids. Into the third hour, it's mostly fatty acids with a little bit of blood glucose. And then in the fourth hour, it's mostly fatty acids and blood glucose. So this is one of the reasons why if you want to burn fat, you have to, you have to work out for longer periods of time. Um, otherwise, you're just going to burn carbohydrate. So muscle stores um, a little bit of ATP, not a lot. Typically, if you've got it, they, they use it. Okay. So ultimately, once it's used up, which is very quickly, um, they need to produce more ATP. And there's a couple of really cheap ways to produce um, ATP for muscles uh, while your um, metabolism is trying desperately to make more ATP to replace what you've used up. The first one is called the creatine phosphate pathway. It's an anaerobic pathway. Um, fermentation is another type of anaerobic pathway, but cellular respiration is the one you really want to use. Right? This is the one where you're using oxygen. It's aerobic respiration and you produce more ATP with this one.
but the problem is it requires oxygen. So you have to wait for your oxygen levels to increase so that you can actually feel the cellular respiration. While you are building that oxygen rate, you oftentimes will um, work out on anaerobic uh, modes. That is to say the uh, creatine phosphate and the fermentation pathway. And so here's kind of what it looks like. So creatine phosphate will basically create creatine plus ATP. So that'll generate your ATP. You can use ATP to rebuild your creatine phosphate stores when you have lots of ATP in your system. Um, glycogen will basically break down into lactate generating ATP. That's a type of fermentation. Um, but you can also take that lactate and ATP and rebuild your glycogen when you have plenty of ATP around. Um, and then of course, aerobic, your glycogen and fatty acids will basically uh, make ATP in your mitochondria. This is cellular respiration. And then you'll be able to make lots and lots of ATP. So this is really what you want, but we know that our oxygen levels have to get up to that point. So in that gap, while we're building up our oxygen, we tend to use these. While we build up our oxygen levels. So this is the, uh, just another way of looking at the creatine phosphate pathway. So basically you're going to have creatine phosphate. ADP is gonna come in here, take that phosphate off the creatine and it's gonna give you creatine left over. So you're gonna make an ATP there. Um, this one is um, when is being formed when a, a muscle cell is resting and you only have a limited amount of this. So this is not a long-term strategy. The CP pathway is used at the beginning of exercise, right? Like I said, when you're in your oxygen buildup stage. Um, so if you have a very short burst, um, like in a football game, um, that's mostly going to be your CP pathway that's doing that. So anaerobic is necessary. Um, longer um, then has to kick into fermentation. Now, fermentation is basically going to produce a couple of ATPs. It's gonna be breaking down glucose uh, to lactate. And so oftentimes this will be controlled hormonally to break down glycogen, makes glucose, which is available as an energy source. So you'll be able to burn that. But fermentation, like the CP pathway is fast acting. So basically it uh, results in the buildup of lactate, which causes a little bit of burn. Um, and so for instance, um, this is kind of your muscle, muscle burn. So when you uh, first start working out, you feel a little bit of burn in your muscles. That's lactate. So lactic acid creates a little bit of that ache and fatigue in your muscles until your oxygen kicks in. And then that, that goes away. That's lactate buildup. So this is happening when you're building up your oxygen. We have a term for that in physiology. We call that oxygen debt, right? So basically um, you have heavy breathing when you're starting to exercise because you build it up at the beginning. Um, and then what happens is you kind of give it all back at the end. And that's kind of why you do that strong breathing after, um, afterwards is because you're basically recalibrating your respiratory system to bring this back down. So the respiration, which requires oxygen, um, means that you have to consume oxygen in order to be able to get it um, to make ATP. So your myoglobin is helpful here, right? So your myoglobin, which is storing oxygen, will I'll be able to feed that oxygen into the mitochondria, um, which can use that oxygen plus some glucose that you got from your stored glycogen, um, glucose in your blood and your fatty acids, for instance, both of those can be converted to glucose. And then what they can do is they can go through cellular respiration to produce lots and lots of ATP. And that's basically what you're going to be doing Long term. That's the reason why you notice a shift between fatty acid utility and gl blood glucose utilities because you're switching into that long term cell respiration mode, and that's the good. That's a good place to be. So when we take a look at twitch, different types of muscles are basically wired with different types of twitch dynamics. We have what's called fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Fast twitch muscles typically are going to be anaerobically driven, so they're going to be relying on creatine phosphate and fermentation. So these are like sprinters, right? Fast twitch, short bursts of energy. Slow twitch fibers are basically gonna be endurance, right? So these gonna be, are gonna be switching to cell respiration. They require aerobic. And so these are basically endurance types of muscles. So a good example of fast twitch would be um, bodybuilding's basically lifting. That'd be fast twitch. 
So short bursts of energy very quickly and slow twitch would be like jogging for a long period of time. So you basically need extended amounts of uh, twitching or muscle contraction. So fast twitch typically are strength. So these are typically strength fibers. And so their motor units will have lots of fibers in them. And so that gives you a good explosion of energy, right? And this is basically like sprinting and weightlifting. That's where you see a lot of fast twitch fibers. Okay, you're building for strength. And um, they typically tend to be fairly light in color because they have fewer mitochondria. They have very little myoglobin. They don't do it. It's basically all on anaerobic respiration and they have fewer blood vessels. Why? Because they don't need the oxygen. Why? Because they're doing it anaerobically. So they develop max tension faster. So they go there very quickly. Um, and the tension tends to be very much greater. Okay. So, but the reliance is on anaerobic energy levels. So you can't maintain it for very long. That's because it's anaerobic and they deplete very quickly. Slow twitch, basically they have fewer muscles per motor unit. This is more of a stamina type of a situation. For instance, endurance sports like long distance running, swimming, jogging, things like that. Most of their energy is gonna be produced aerobically. So they need, they need oxygen, right? That basically means they need oxygen. And they also have a lot of myoglobin because this is storing oxygen and they have lots of mitochondria because they're doing cell respiration and they need a lot of blood. So they tend to be darker in color. And so these tend to be surrounded by capillary beds. Why? To draw more blood and oxygen to them, right? So that's what they need. So their tension develops slowly, um, but they tend to last for a long time. And so they basically will have a reserve of glycogen and fat, and then they'll be able to feed this to their mitochondria to make ATP. By the way, if you're wondering, because the slow twitch fibers tend to be darker in color and the fast twitch fibers tend to be lighter in color, this is basically what we get when we have things like white meat and dark meat in things like turkey and things of that nature. Okay. So different types of muscle conditions. So let's take a look at the idea of spasms. So spasm basically simply is just an involuntary muscle contraction, oftentimes, but not always, accompanied by pain. And so this can happen either in smooth muscle or in skeletal muscle. A convulsion is basically multiple spasms and they tend to be much more aggressive. Now cramps is a strong, painful spasm that's due to strenuous activity usually lasts longer than a spasm. So it's kind of like a spasm that contracts but doesn't relax. And a spasm, it contracts and relax. <coughs> it's more severe. A cramp is a more severe version of a spasm. Facial tics are simply spasms in the facial muscles. And so they just kind of start twitching. So like your eye will start twitching sometimes. Um, and there's just like, a, just a, it's just a random firing of the muscle contraction. So muscle strain is basically either stretching or tearing of a muscle. Um, oftentimes when we say we pulled a muscle, it's actually what it, it's usually a strained muscle. A sprain is basically the twisting of a joint typically leads to swelling and injury of the muscles, but usually you've done damage to ligaments, to tendons, to blood vessels, and things like that. So a sprain is basically an injury to a joint and all of the surrounding tissue. Now, tendonitis is basically inflammation of a tendon. So essentially it could be irritated by a bursa, could be caused by bursitis, which is the inflammation of a bursa. Uh, but basically this is the idea of inflammation of a particular tendon itself. Then we have some of the muscular diseases. So myalgia, for instance, is achy muscles, um, could be caused by overuse of the muscles. 
uh, myositis is inflammation of the muscles, oftentimes caused by a viral infection or an immune disorder of some sort. Fibromyalgia is basically a chronic condition that's uh, typified by pain and tenderness, stiffness in the muscles. We don't really know what causes fibromyalgia, um, but it's kind of like a chronic condition. Muscular dystrophy is basically a type of degenerating muscle musculature. So you get weakness, weakening muscles, degenerating muscles. And this is kind of an entire spectrum of different types of, of muscle weakening. So Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is the most common type. This is a genetic disorder that where you um, lack the protein dystrophin. Um, and what happens is calcium leaks into the cell. Oh, there we go again. Okay. Hold on. That time I I believe that was PowerPoint doing that one. We're almost to the end. So come on, PowerPoint. Hold on. We can do this. Okay. Basically, it's a lack of dystrophin. So calcium leaks into the cell and basically activates the enzyme um, or an enzyme that essentially chews up and dissolves muscle fiber. So you're actually just chewing up the muscle fiber. Myasthenia gravis is oftentimes an autoimmune disease. Um, this is kind of get muscular weakening, eyelids, face, neck, extremities, or muscles just start getting weak. Um, and it starts to produce antibodies. Your immune system just produces antibodies. It destroys acetylcholine receptors. And so that basically eliminates that ability to transmit the contraction signal to your muscles. And so sometimes we can take drugs to inhibit um, this enzyme that digests acetylcholine. Um, so then you get acetylcholine accumulation in those neuromuscular uh, areas, those uh, synaptic clefts. Of course, then we have muscular cancer. So sarcomas basically are cancers that originate in the muscle. Um, they can also occur in bone or adipose or cartilage, but oftentimes it can oppose in the associated musculature as well. So now let's take a look at um, homeostasis, right? So when we take a look at homeostasis, we can see how the muscular system basically touches on just about every other organ. So for instance, in your cardiovascular system, this is basically cardiac muscle that delivers blood and oxygen to the rest of the body. Muscle contraction essentially is what's responsible for moving the fluid through your ureter and your bladder. This is basically how it touches your urinary system. Your digestive system is a peristaltic movement, muscles, and your digestive system that moves the food through your intestines. In your nervous system, your muscle contraction will move your eyes, will allow for speech, and it also creates facial expressions. So basically your senses are driven or partly driven by your muscles, your endocrine system. So ultimately, um, these guys will regulate muscle development. In your respiratory system, you have a diaphragm that actually causes uh, your ability to inhale and your reproductive system, basically your repro your muscular contractions are essentially what moves the gametes uh, through the reproductive tract. So we can see how musculature basically touches in just about every place in the body. So essentially, when we take a look at the muscle and the skeleton, they work together to produce movement. So for instance, skeletal muscles contract and pull the bones. This allows us to respond to changes in the environment, it also allows us to be able to do things like chewing and things of that nature. And then they also will contract and move food through the digestive system. The heart, which is a cardiac muscle, will contract and deliver blood. Um, and then contracting skeletal muscles will allow blood to be moved back toward the heart. And the brain um, and the heart and the lungs are all protected by the skeleton. And the skeletal muscles will pad and protect the bones. And so you can see a lot of times um, that like the skeleton, for instance, the muscles can also be protective by protecting your internal digestive organs. So this is one of the reasons why in some books, we actually lump the two systems together, musculoskeletal, um, to be, and we basically study both the skeletal and muscle system together. So it is a huge component of body temperature regulation. So for instance, when you get too cold, your smooth muscles will constrict inside your blood vessels, supplying the skin. So this conserves heat, keeps the heat in the core.
Also, your skeletal muscles will start to contract and you'll start shivering. What are you trying to do? You're basically trying to produce heat. Remember we said before that skeletal muscles are the heat generated. So the reason why you shiver when you're cold is because you're trying to increase your body temperature. You're trying to shiver to get heat. And then of course, uh, goosebumps, which is forming in cold temperatures is the function of the erector pili muscles that contract in your skin. This causes your hairs to stand up. Uh, not very helpful in keeping us warm, but is quite effective in other animals. So they have thicker fur coats and they can get a lot of that air trapped in there and kind of basically kind of fluff up their coat a little bit, kind of make them a little bit warmer. It's kind of like putting an extra layer of heat on their body. And so that's basically it. Finally, we made it. We made it through this chapter, the end of chapter 13.